Hello, and welcome to an experiment, an experiment in a new age of distance education for Lewisburg College. Why is it an experiment? Well, we are now in the dead of the winter of 2015. I am a professor of environmental science at Lewisburg College, and lo and behold, I have missed a total of six lectures and laboratories in my environmental biology class, Bio 140. Why? Because it's snowing. And yeah, it's going to snow again tomorrow. So I've decided to team up with a good friend of mine, Amnon Nissan, who's producing this show of Nissan Communications in Raleigh, North Carolina, to go online. Now, when I say distance education and online, this is not to substitute for my course. It is not to do something that is going to replace my live lectures. Rather, it is something that's going to supplement my lectures so students can go online 24-7, come to this site, and they will be able to listen to the lectures, see the PowerPoint slides, and indeed, See it again and again and again, if that's the way they wish. If they have nothing else better to do, they could look at me all day and night. So this is going to be an experimental shot. Uh, I am today going to work on three different lectures, uh, what we call Chapter 9, Chapter 10, and Chapter 11. What does that mean to my students? What it means is that we are following the book. Okay, we have a wonderful book, uh, Environmental Science by Cunningham, and my lectures pretty much go with the pagination of the book, the highlights of what I try to cover. So we are going to begin right now with Chapter 9. And when I tell my students, go to, for example, Figure 1.0 or Table 9.3, they can follow it along in the book. I don't have to show it here. So therefore, students, get your book out and listen to the lecture, take notes, and we're going to experiment and see how this works out. I am confident that we have a real great system here for you to be able to study environmental biology, have the lectures in the labs at the college, and be able to follow up in your study habits so that you are prepared to ace that exam. So, we begin now with chapter number nine, a very important chapter called Food and Agriculture, which deals primarily with hunger. This is a subject that most of us in the United States pretty much forsake. Uh, food is plentiful. We have the most nutritious and plentiful food supply anywhere on the planet. On the other hand, as I often point out to my students, I put my fickle four fingers up, okay, to remind them that we in the United States represent a mere 4.2% of the world's population. That's it, okay? We are almost statistically insignificant. And so when we talk about food and hunger, we can't only talk about our own home, but we need to discuss the world at large and what the problems are. Well, let's start off with a number. Today, we have at least 1.5 billion individuals on our planet who are chronically undernourished. And we will define what that means, okay? And you see right now uh, on your screen, uh, chapter 9, Food and Ag, and you're following the words that we are using. The definition of chronically undernourished means that an individual, an adult individual, is taking in less than 2,200 kilocalories every day. Now, that is for a pretty sedentary adult, that's like you and me, who aren't out slaving in the field, climbing glaciers, climbing over high passes, the way people have to do in order to make a living. Uh, it reminds me of the time that I was in the Himalayas, and we had Sherpas that we had to supply 7,700 kilocalories a day, and there was not a single ounce of fat on their bodies. 
So the amount of calories you need has to be proportional to the amount of calories that you actually use. And as we are going to find out, this is a chronic world problem. So food security, back to our slide, okay? Food security is something that, again, most of us in the United States don't worry about this. On the other hand, plenty do, and we'll talk about that. The ability to obtain sufficient food on a daily basis, which is really the basis of all civilization. Think about it. If you were a hunter-gatherer 9,000 years ago, what would you be spending your time doing? You'd be going out hunting and gathering. That's your life. You have to be able to supply enough food for yourself and your family in order to simply survive. Today, we go to the food market. We have prepared foods for us. We don't have to worry about that, and hence, there's time for math and science and art and music and the things that actually qualify us as being human beings, what the meaning of civilization is. So food security means you know where your next meal is going to come from. I will remind you that even here in eastern North Carolina, there are nearly 600,000 people that lack food security. They are unemployed. They are perhaps under or non-educated. They might be on food stamps, but that will not even provide them enough food to feed their family nutritiously. And hence, we have food banks to supply these people. Okay, at least we have a safety net. There is a safety net. When we look at most of the countries in the world, particularly the developing countries, there is no safety net. Well, moving on with our definitions. Famine. Large-scale food or water shortage resulting in starvation, political and social disruption, and economic chaos are the primary causes of famine. Yes, there's enough food on our planet today to feed every man, woman, and child at least 2,200 kilocalories a day. On the other hand, people are starving. I have here September uh, 2011, there was a tremendous drought in the Horn of Africa, talking about Ethiopia, Somalia, the Sudan, Darfur. And at that time, the World Health Organization classified 114 million individuals, human beings, that were on the verge of starvation indeed. Many of them did die. So, moving on. Again, we always begin our chapters with definitions. Uh, that's the nature of science. We have to learn our definitions in order to talk about the issue. Malnourishment. Wow. Okay. Malnourishment is not undernourishment. And this is something that is incredibly ironic. Let's talk about a sad reality here in America, okay? And it's something that's antithetical. It might surprise you, but it has been published many times. The poorer you are, the heavier you are. I'll say it again. The poorer you are, the heavier you are here in the United States. Why? It's simple. You can go to the store buy five boxes of macaroni and cheese for a dollar, buy a 10-pound bag of rice, buy uh, a um, loaf of white bread for a dollar, okay? You're going to get calories. You're going to get lots of calories. Nevertheless, you are malnourished. You are not getting the proper amount of protein, fiber, vitamins, minerals, nutrition, okay? The wealthier you are, okay, which means you have unlimited money to be able to buy food, what are you buying? You're buying high-quality, lean meat and fish and poultry, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, okay, eating salads, eating high-quality dairy products. That costs a lot of money. And indeed, you are properly nourished. So malnourishment does not mean that you're starving to death. It means you are not eating properly. 
One of the examples of this is if you don't have enough iron, which comes from fresh vegetables and meat, you can be highly anemic, which means you're going to be tired all the time. Now, when we take this to the extreme, we have some definitions that are actually quite sad. I have witnessed this in Africa and Central America, and it is, as I said, unbelievably sad. We have to have, human beings have to have approximately 70 grams of protein every day. That's to survive. That's to live. That's to build muscles. Our brain requires the nitrogen in protein. The fact is, is that there are millions around the world that have little or no access to protein. If they're landlocked, for example, they can't go fishing. They're landlocked in their country. They might have eaten up all the bush meat. The birds, the animals in the forest, there's nothing left to eat. This results in what the African definition is called quasiacor. You see it's spelt on your page, and in Asia called marasmus. And this is acute protein deficiency. Uh, often you will see pictures of a town that's starving. 150, 200 years ago, we didn't really understand that. You'd have explorers like Richard Burton going into the deep jungles of Africa, coming upon a town, and there would be little children walking around, tiny children, with bloated bellies. Their arms and legs were sticks. You could see the, the sutures in their brain cavities coming out, okay? But in reality, their bellies are huge. And the reports would come back to England and say, my God, what well-fed children with these big fat bellies, in fact, these were children in the final throes of death. Their body was ingesting and digesting itself, causing gas, methane to build up in the abdominal cavity, bloating their bellies out, and unfortunately, once it has reached that stage, these children are lost. There's no way to bring them back. So, what goes on with our food supply? Let's take a look on our next slide at the big four. Okay, the big four, okay, is a really remarkable thing that has happened to society. Remember, 9,000 years ago, we were hunters and gatherers. What did we do? We went around eating, learning to eat things, and we ate whatever was available. Okay, you think of Amazonian tribes even today. They live off the land, the plants, the animals, the fish that's in the water. Today, get this, 92% of all the nutrition eaten by humanity on our entire planet is summarized in Table 9.1 of your book, The Important Food Sources. Wheat, rice, maize, and potatoes. Maize, for those of you who don't understand, is corn. Okay, We are the only country in the world that calls it corn. Okay, you go anywhere else on the planet, and it's called maize, okay? Rice, obviously, huge, over 60% of all the calories eaten throughout Asia. Wheat, major source of nutrition here in North America and in Europe. Maize, Central and South America, they eat tortilla and maize and potatoes, which originally came from the Andes Mountains of South America are now found on every continent in the world. They are easy to grow. But let's take a look at the big four. Wheat, rice, maize, and potatoes. What do we end up with? We end up with starch. We end up with calories. Very little protein. Not that much in the ways of vitamin, minerals, nutrition. And so as a result... We have taken hundreds and hundreds of edible species and basically whittled them down into the big four, which comprise those starchy fruits, foods, and that causes us problems. It causes us problems. Well, back to the issue again. What is the thing that people want the most? And it's kind of funny. Uh, when I was in China, I met with their ministry of the uh, minister of the environment. He actually was educated uh, here in the United States, 
and we were talking about environmental issues, and this was back in the 1990s, and I said, Minister, sir, what is it that your people want? Your people represent a quarter of the human race. What is it that they want? And he looked at me without hesitation and said, meat. We want meat. And you know, it's not that long, maybe 15 years since I had that, 16, 18 years since I had that conversation. And what has happened throughout Asia, particularly in China, the consumption of meat has gone through the roof. Let's look right here in North Carolina. Eastern North Carolina, we have three big industries. Chicken, number two in the country. Turkey, number one in the country. And hogs, number two in the country. How many of you knew that over 60% of all that meat is shipped to Asia? The demand for meat products throughout the world is unbelievable. But with that comes a problem. Listen to these numbers. Beef, cows, okay? It takes 80 pounds of grain to produce one pound of beef. Hogs, 30 pounds of grain to create one pound of pork. Chickens and turkeys have the best conversion rate. It's about three to five pounds of grain will create one pound of chicken and turkey. But what's the message here? Notice the word that I'm using consistently, grain. They're eating grain. Well, guess who else can eat grain? People. Okay, here's one that'll blow your mind. The United States is the largest maize producer in the world. Corn. 72% of all the corn grown in the United States. 85% of all the soybeans grown in the United States goes to what? Animal feed. We are feeding animals in order to create meat. Okay? This is ecologically not the greatest thing we could be doing. We're depleting our soils. We're depleting our resources because of our and, in fact, the world's lust for meat products. Additionally, back to our slide, one of the things we have to remember, and this is a big deal today, think about when you go to the school, to the store. What's, go up to the egg counter. You have a choice now. Two years ago, you didn't have a choice. Now you have a choice. Over on the right, you got regular eggs. They're white eggs. They come from Lager and chickens, and they come from CAFOs. Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. Well, what is a CAFO? You are a chicken. You are sitting in a cage that's about three inches on the left and the right and three inches in the front and the back. Your head is sticking out of a hole. And 24 hours a day, you have food running by you and water by running by you in troughs. Underneath, there are slats where the poop comes out. That's it. Guess what? Beef cattle, hogs are often grown the exact same way. Why? It is efficient. It is a way of getting as much food into those animals as possible so they are putting on the most weight in the least amount of time. Guess what? It's why we have some of the lowest food prices anywhere on the planet. CAFOs. A lot of people are not happy with that at all. As a result, what do we have? We have organic, free-range chickens. I mean, free-range chicken means exactly what it says. It's running around. Okay, when it reaches the proper age, well, then it goes in the truck and you know the rest of the story. Okay, but they are, as once some people might say, happy chickens. Okay, what about cage-free eggs? Same deal. They let the chickens run around. They put little bales of hay around the field. And when a chicken is ready to go and lay their egg, they'll go up to it. They'll lay their egg and they'll go back and start pecking for worms and bugs and doing what they're doing. And they're happy laying chickens. Okay? This is what we are now moving towards. 
The problem with that, although it is ecologically far better, is the price is often double and triple the cost of CAFO products. Okay, so let's talk about agriculture and with our next slide and talk about something that is really important in understanding some of the problems that we have. Okay, seafood. Seafood has been one of our most important mainstays in the development of civilizations. Think about where civilizations rose on the Mediterranean, okay, on coastal areas around the world. That's because, guess what? Seafood is free. You go to the ocean, you learn how to use your nets, you learn how to fish, okay? And indeed, today, two billion people on our planet, okay, rely on fishing for their substance, for their food, okay? And that's good, okay, that they are, in fact, relying on that seafood. But what's happening? And this is so real that you can feel it every day if you go to the food store. The oceans are being depleted. Now, on the surface, you say to yourself, what, what are you talking about? The oceans, 76% of the, wor- of the Earth's surface, filled with fish and animals and whales and whatever else. Yeah, yeah. Over the past 50 years, through commercial fishing operations on boats 1,500 feet long, carrying 2,000 men, dragging nets behind them for hundreds of miles, we have practically fished out the major seafood resources in our ocean. Drag nets, literally, I use the word vacuum, miles of ocean. Now, when they drag their nets on these miles of ocean, guess what they catch? Everything. Whatever's there. Okay, sharks, dolphins, turtles, whatever happens to be there gets dragged up. Then they take these huge nets on cranes and lift them on to the surface of the boat. They open the net up and splooge. All of this teeming life comes out on the deck. They bring in conveyor belts and hundreds of men start throwing the various animals that they've got on different conveyor belts, what are they trying to get? They're trying to get the fish, particularly the high-valued fish, whether it be a type of snapper or cod or whatever. Guess what's left behind? Called bycatch. What is bycatch? Well, there's an easy way to tell. If you are out in the middle of the ocean, you're taking a cruise from here to Europe, on the Queen Mary. Once in a while, if you have a clear day and you look off the deck of the ship, it might be 50 miles away, you will see another giant ship, and you know how you tell that it's there? Not by the ship, but because it is being surrounded and overflown by tens of thousands of birds. Now, I'm talking about a thousand miles out to sea. I'm not talking about 100 miles off the coast. Remember, birds have to lay down at some time and sleep. These are tens of thousands of birds that are, that are swarming like bees around these gigantic ships. What are they there for? Just have a good day? Have some fun? Watch a movie? I don't think so. They are there because on these giant commercial vessels, 24 hours a day, they are processing fish. But guess what's happened to the bycatch? Over the rail. Tons and tons and tons. Part of their bycatch, sadly, are sharks. But before they throw the shark overboard, what do they do? They cut off the fins. Shark fins are worth as much as $400 a kilogram in the Asian markets. So you have a shark. Big, 700-pound shark, it has a dorsal fin, it has the side fins, and they take big, big machetes, cut them off, and all that's left is a torpedo. 
Okay, a finless shark, they throw it overboard, it just waddles. Okay, and it's helpless, and the birds will come in and feed off that dying shark. Bycatch. Wasting millions of tons of our sea resources. Well, what's going to happen in the future? The future, there's good news and bad news. The good news is, is everybody loves shrimp, right? You go to the store and you buy a pound of shrimp. Next time you go, I want you to look at the bag in very tiny letters on the back. Or ask the fishmonger, where'd that shrimp come from? And the odds are, it is not from North Carolina, it is not from Louisiana, it is from Thailand. Over 80% of all the shrimp in the world are farmed. Fish farms, not at the coast, inland. Big, giant lakes filled with salt water growing shrimp by the ton. This is the future of seafood. Today, you have catfish, tilapia, okay? They are now uh, in uh, Belize, thinking about trying to grow uh, tropical lobsters. All types of seafood is being grown by the means of actually growing them like food in a pond. Sea bass are now grown, okay? Striped bass are now grown on fish farms. Well, On the surface, you'd say, well, this is good. And as I said, there's good news, bad news here. Why is it good? It is good in the sense that obviously for every ton of fish that you're getting from a fish farm, it's a ton of fish you're not taking from the oceans, which will give the oceans time to repair itself. On the other hand, the amount of pollution that's created in these ponds, okay, not to be crude, but sea creatures poop, and that poop has to be dredged out, and where do they put it? In rivers. They put it in the ocean, and it eutrophies. It adds all types of nutrients to where they're not supposed to be. You end up with toxic algae blooms around areas where you are farming fish. In addition, folks, you know, you've heard about it, and unfortunately it's true. In the same way, that I have my little piggy in its pen with its food running in front of it 24 hours a day and its poop being taken out the bottom, okay, we have the same thing going on with fish farms where they concentrate them and in their food they put hormones and antibiotics. Why? They grow faster. The idea is is to get as much tonnage of shrimp fish, bass, whatever, per unit of time. It's a business. It is a business. And hence, folks, when you buy farmed fish, you are eating those hormones and antibiotics that were put in the fish. And I got news for you. Most fish, unlike meat, is not regulated by our government. So you don't really know what's going on. Long story made short, however, we're here to talk about facts. By the year 2100, the U.S. Department of Agriculture anticipates that 80% of all the seafood eaten on our planet will, in fact, be via fish farming. Okay, let's move on. So, during the um, Green Revolution... Okay. During our uh, discussion of agriculture, okay, it is really important that we talk about something that occurred in our history, but in fact, okay, is something that is a story of glory and of demise. I love to brag about this. Okay, the only person in the history of the Nobel Prize begun in 1895, who was an agricultural scientist, was Dr. Norman Borlaug, a plant pathologist, one of my PhDs is in that field, from the University of Minnesota. He was at Minnesota in the 1950s. 
And he was a visionary. He just died two years ago at the age of 96. Sharp as a tack. Unbelievable man. But in reality, what happened is he came up with a new idea, with a new principle. That principle was to create a green revolution. A green revolution. Well, what did Dr. Norman Borlaug do? He got a grant. Okay, got a grant from the Ford Foundation. And it allowed him to work in two places, in Mexico and in the Philippines. In Mexico, he created a corn and wheat institute. In the Philippines, Asia, of course, he created a rice institute. And as a result, he was able to come up with a statement that was unbelievable, and that is famine will be eliminated from the human race there will be food for all. This is the time I was in college, guys, like you, okay? Beginning graduate school in the 60s. And wow, they were heady times because we actually believed, and Borlaug was given the Nobel Prize, that we were going all to eliminate the famine of over a billion people on our planet. So what did he do? By using hybridized crops by using intensive amounts of fertilizer, pesticide, irrigation, and developing, along with Ford, remember that's who gave him his grant, okay, gigantic machinery, tractors that could disc up 10 rows at a time, combines that could harvest 50 rows of wheat, or 20 rows of corn in one pass through the field, he ended up revolutionizing agriculture. Okay? What are the numbers? They're astounding. Okay? The typical yield, for example, of corn in a place like Iowa would be about 125 bushels per acre. Green Revolution, 400. 500 bushels per acre. Rice. 300% increases in yield. Wheat, double increases in yield. We had, as I say proverbially, food coming out of our ears. We were burning it. We were burying it. We were giving it away. We had too much food as a result of the Green Revolution. So, to watch my hands, basically... On a timeline, we had food production since a 1,000 years ago going like this, up and down and up and down and up and down. All of a sudden, that curve started to go straight up in the late 1960s through the mid-1970s. We were using the Green Revolution to produce food, and there was no end in sight. And something happened. My friend Amnon, ours was producing the show across from me, remembers this. Most of us old fogies remember it. It was the fateful year of 1979. OPEC, the oil-producing nations, decided they were going to put an embargo on Europe and the United States. Gasoline went from 50 cents a gallon to $2 a gallon. Now, we're talking about $1979. That's equivalent to $6 a gallon today. That wasn't the problem. I would be on a line for four hours, a mile long, and when I got up to the pump, there would be a guy there, typically with a pistol in his holster, okay, saying, five gallons they give you five gallons of gas at six bucks our equivalent per gallon. Guess what? Let's go back to that slide. Fertilizer. Fertilizer, nitrogen is made from petroleum products. Pesticides, all based on petroleum products. Irrigation. Guess what? The water doesn't jump out of the pond onto the corn. It has a giant diesel engine burning fuel to pump the water onto the field, and finally, that gigantic machinery that we talked about, 
where some of these instruments, you'd be lucky to get 10 gallons per mile out of it. Giant engines, the combines and everything, moving its way through the uh, way. So, the common denominator of the Green Revolution was energy. Cheap energy was actually the driving force that made food production go through the roof. Energy intensive. I love looking at this right here, okay? This is when I began driving. I have to I always use this as a joke. I got my driver's license and I'll never forget went to the, went to the gas station. It was a mobile station and gas was 16 cents a gallon. Fill up my big car. I think I was driving an Oldsmobile 98. Okay, my father bought it for me. Uh, you know, like seven miles per gallon. Fill her up. Okay, I'll never forget. I was driving somewhere and I pulled into the station. Gas went to 17 cents a gallon. And I yelled at the guy. What are you doing? It's up to 17 cents a gallon? you got to be kidding me. Now, back then, diesel fuel was a byproduct of making gasoline. It was nine cents a gallon. Today, now it's the opposite, okay, where gasoline is cheaper. But I'm trying to give you perspective, guys. 1968 is not all that long ago to understand the fact what happened with the price of fuel, okay? Okay, what happened? That line, okay, going up and up and up. All of a sudden, 1979, 1980, it flattens out. It flattens out, and folks, on a global basis, yield per acre since the late 1970s has slowly been going down. We can't, we, meaning the world, can't afford $200 a gallon pesticides, can't afford diesel fuel, can't afford to irrigate, can't afford to do these things, and so we, again, we're looking at, and indeed today, are looking at starvation. What was the answer? Well, concomitant to this entire thing taking place, a new generation of scientists were being minted, including me. This is the time that I received my degrees. And part of the curriculum as a biologist is you had to study molecular biology. And part of molecular biology was a new term the new kid on the block, genetic engineering. Whoa, okay? Genetic engineering. Transgenic genes. Taking the genes from one organism and transplanting them to another. The most famous example being the Monsanto flavor saver tomato. Okay, anybody who's ever, who's old, okay, okay? And ate tomatoes back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Remember, during the winter, they tasted like cardboard. They were harvested green. And you had to wait for them to get kind of orange. And blah, okay? Well, Monsanto, some genius scientist, came up with an idea, which is brilliant. When you think of the, these crazy people, and guess what, guess what the word is for GMO food? Franken food, Okay? And it's still used today. These crazy scientists, a guy was fishing at the beach, and he caught a flounder. Anybody ever catch a flounder? The bottom is white and smooth. The top is slimy. Blah! It's got this, this pure, gelatinous, transparent slime covering the top. And this scientist said, I wonder what that's for. It's protein, obviously. The fish is protein. Fish is not made out of carbohydrates, okay? And he started breaking it down. And what did he find out? He found out that that protein had all different types of antioxidant protective factors. Lo and behold, he coded the gene for the slime, put the slime gene into a regular big boy tomato plant, and what came out was flavor saver tomatoes were a beautiful tomato could be grown in a greenhouse or in the field in Mexico or South Florida and turn red on the vine.
Beautiful. That's what you want. Red on the vine. All the nutrients. You pick it. You put it into a box. At 21 days later, it would be hard and firm. Think about a tomato. Doesn't last 21 days. It rots hard and firm. Holy cow. It just revolutionized the tomato industry. We could grow tomatoes any time of the year and have beautiful, fresh tomatoes. So they released it here in North Carolina. The first place it was released was Harris Teeter. And I went to buy some Flavor Saver tomatoes the first day they came out. So what happened? I pull into the parking lot and I go, holy cow, what's going on here? What was going on? The place was filled with picketers holding signs, okay? God is against Monsanto. Monsanto breeds frankenfood. I won't eat transgenic flounder tomatoes against the Lord, okay? Guess how long the flavor saver tomato was sold in the United States? One day before all the stores pulled it off their shelves announced we won't sell it anymore. They were getting boycotted. Don't go to this store. They're selling frankenfood one day. This is an issue we're going to tackle later on in this course. But the fact simply is, is that we now, whether we like it or not, here's some numbers for you. In the United States, 98% of the corn that you are eating is genetically modified. 92% of the soybeans that you are eating is genetically modified, okay? Cotton, you don't eat it, but virtually all cotton is genetically modified. The news on the street last week is a brand new apple was developed in Canada. What happens? You slice an apple up, you put it on the bench, come back a half hour later, what do you got? A brown apple. It oxidizes. Polyphenol oxidase is the gene that oxidizes it in the apple. They took the polyphenol oxidase out of the apple. You cut the apple now, you put it down. Two days later, it's going to sit there as white as it was the day it was cut. It won't oxidize. Will you eat it? How about you? Okay. I don't know. But BT crops for insect-resistant, Roundup-ready crops, okay, These are all things that we are dealing with as a way of moving forward. All right, sustainable agriculture. This is the opposite of genetically modified crops, okay? Now we're talking about our friends organic farming. Now, you may say or think that's a joke. It's no joke. Organic farming now represents a $40 billion industry in the United States. Now, what does organic farming mean? Real quick, no chemicals, no genetically modified foods, no fertilizer, no nothing, okay? It has to be natural seeds that are grown in a natural environment. The growth of this industry is now 17% per year. 17% per year. Mom and dad don't trust agriculture. They want USDA certified organic food, and you pay for it. What does this mean, though? Sustainable agriculture is not only good for your body, but it's good for the environment. It means we are conserving the soil. No erosion, no soil mining of nutrients using organic farming techniques. This, you know what organic farming techniques is? Your back and a hoe. That's what organic farming is. It's work, okay? It is work. It is finding natural ways to irrigate, using drip irrigation from, from gravity-fed streams, okay? Fascinatingly, here I'm talking from Wake County, okay? I teach you guys up at Lewisburg in in Franklin County. Just to the west of here is Chatham County. Chatham County is one of the largest organic vegetable producers in the country. A lot of people, even professors from my old school, NC State, go there and start organic farms. Okay? They use plowing techniques 
rather than allowing erosion to take away the soil, contour and terracing, strip cropping, intercropping, double cropping. For example, very simple. We all know soybeans are nitrogen-fixing plants. It means they actually make nitrogen in the soil. They make more nutrients in the soil than they take out. Corn is a nitrogen mining plant. It loves sucking nitrogen up in order to grow those big corns that we love to eat all during the summer. At least I do, okay? Why don't you plant one strip of soybeans and right next to it, plant a strip of corn? The corn is harvested first. Go down and harvest it. And the soybeans are now opened up to the sky, full sunlight, and the soybeans are harvested second. No plowing. Nutrients, one plant feeding the other. Common sense. Common sense is the way that we are moving forward in this thing. All right, here's something new on the block, and it's important. Okay, something even further. Okay, I joke with my family all the time. It's amazing. I want everybody to take a field trip, everybody who's listening to me right now. And probably the best place to do it is Harris Teeter. Harris Teeter is an upscale uh, food purveyor. Take a pad and a pencil, okay, and walk in to the Harris Teeter and go to the fresh produce market and start looking at the boxes and the bags and the labels. I did this about five years ago, and I found food. You're sitting down from 38 different countries, from India, from Bangladesh, from Thailand and Indonesia, from Peru and Chile, from Brazil and Guatemala, okay, all over the planet. Why? Because down there, our wintertime is their summertime. Chile, unbelievable. Costa Rica, unbelievable markets, plains filled with produce coming into Miami and being distributed all over the United States. Well, that's fine, except think about it, folks. Okay, we're trying to be sustainable. You have a box of raspberries that was grown in southern Chile. It had to be transported 7,000 miles to the United States by airplane in most cases, okay? Think of the cost of the fuel to be able to do that. Think of the, the, the environmental degradation, the global warming, the carbon dioxide emissions, okay? What is the result? A new thing is on the block. It began in California, like most things do, okay? And it's called locavore, okay? Vore means to eat. Loca means that you're crazy. No, it means it's local, okay? Eating locally. We have a rule. Each different town has a different rule. Here in Raleigh, we have a locavore group, and they are sworn to not eat food that comes from more than 75 miles away. Now, we're fortunate. How many of you knew that North Carolina has the largest diversity of commercial crops of any state in the Union? 128 different crops are grown in North Carolina. So particularly spring, summer, fall, we have unbelievable, go to the farmer's market, unbelievable choices in the winter. Guess what? You're not eating raspberries. You're not eating strawberries. You're not eating asparagus in the middle of, of February. You're going to eat what's available. What do we have? We have sweet potatoes, potatoes, carrots, cabbage, other things, with the idea that we're going to eat locally. So one of the funny things they did is a guy at the University of Texas decided to dissect a Taco Bell bean taco, regular bean taco. Where did all this stuff come from? And he actually got their supply chain. That bean taco that you're eating for 59 cents is the result of 11,790 miles of transporting ingredients for you to stick that taco in your mouth. Not funny, okay? So, basically, what is the story here, okay? 
Okay, what is the story here? The story is, is that we are in a situation where food and agriculture, of course, is the largest industry in the world. We talk about industries. There's no industry larger than food and agriculture because I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. Everybody has to eat. What's take home message number one? There's more than enough food on our planet to be able to feed every man, woman, and child. That's rule number one. Rule number two, the reason why people are starving to death is because of politics. Politics, the distribution of food, the stealing of free food that's given to nations, okay? An example was the tra tragedy in Haiti where people were starving to death and they did not have the ability to distribute food but given by the megaton by the United States and Europe. That is a travesty. Secondly, we are depleting our resources, whether it be our soil, whether it be our oceans. We have to figure out better and more efficient ways to grow food. And finally, we have a new revolution. And that revolution are usually educated, responsible people who are saying, I'm going to live light on the land. I don't want toxins in my food. I don't want to be importing my food from tens of thousands of miles away. I want to eat locally. A very important topic, tremendous importance to environmental sustainability. Well, thank you. That ends our lecture number nine on food, agriculture, and hunger. And you can review this as much as you want. Stay tuned for lecture number 10. Have a great day.